Well, good evening, and welcome to our Good Friday service. When I personally think about Good Friday and what happened over 2,000 years ago, one of the first Bible verses that comes to mind for me is 2 Corinthians 5.21. And 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this, He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of of God. And if that was your first time hearing that verse, you might have said, wow, that sounds like a mouthful. But there are some simple and almost unfathomable truths in that verse. And from the very beginning, it says, he made him, meaning God made Jesus, the innocent one, the God-man, the one who lived from eternity past, the one who lived the perfect spirit-filled life. God made him to be sin. For us. Amen? So through faith in Christ, we have forgiveness because on the cross, He took the wrath of God on our behalf and for those who all believe. But the very end of the verse says this so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. So through faith in Christ, we have forgiveness and we also have Christ's righteousness. What a beautiful thing. But tonight on Good Friday, we want to hone in on what Jesus endured on his road to the cross, what this innocent man went through to pay our sin debt. So tonight we have a special service lined up for you tonight. We have five small sermonettes, and each sermonette is going to paint a scene of what Jesus endured on his, on his way to Calvary. The first scene will be Judas's betrayal. And the last one will be our Savior on the cross. And after each sermonette, we're going to have a time of singing together, praising the innocent one who took our sin upon himself on the cross 2,000 years ago. So let's prepare our hearts for worship, and let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for Good Friday, that your love was so clearly shown through your sacrificial act on the cross. Lord, help that not just to be a blip in history, but a significant event in our hearts where, Lord, we would worship you every day of our lives because you are worthy. You are a worthy Savior, Lord. And we are so grateful for that reality. Help us to glorify you tonight in all that we do. It's in Christ's name we pray. There's many scenes we could focus in as we look at the road to the cross. Um, And as we study our Bibles, each and every scene has uh, just great images painted. As we understand our Lord Jesus Christ, we let our minds grasp this glorious Savior who the Bible says was despised and rejected for men. To see our Savior bear grief, he bore the grief, he was smitten by God, he was pierced for our transgressions. So every scene there is highlighted as we study this, this impeccability, this innocence of Christ, and it is proclaimed over and over throughout these texts. As we'll see tonight, the scene after scene proclaims that he is innocent. And there's a cast of characters Some who will most likely die in their sins proclaim him innocent, and others get saved who proclaim his innocence. But Good Friday service is both sobering and full of joy, isn't it? It's sobering because we come face to face that he's on that cross because of us. But it's full of joy too, isn't it? Because we know that we're free from our sin because he did obey the Father. He fulfilled his will perfectly And we find great joy in his amazing grace. So five scenes tonight as we watch our innocent Savior and his road to the cross. Matthew 27, if you have a Bible or a phone or just want to listen along tonight, our first scene I want to look at is in Matthew 27, 1 through 10. And it's the scene of innocent blood. The Bible says this, Now when morning came, all the chief priests and elders and the people conferred together against Jesus to put him to death. They bound him and led him away and delivered him to Pilate, the governor. 
Well, you see, this marks a new day. Friday has come, and this is the day of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And after a brutal, uh, illegal nighttime trial, the religious leaders are now ready to commit murder. They bind Jesus. Isn't that interesting? Notice that. As though he's some kind of dangerous man. And they deliver him to one whom they know they can manipulate. But then there's Judas. He's there. He starts out the last, sur- the last Supper with them, but he leaves in the middle of it, and he goes and betrays Jesus. It seems Judas has great guilt now. And you notice in verse 3 that Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that he, had, he was condemned, and he felt remorse. And he returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest and to the elders. Well, here Judas has this level of guilt that he's struggling with. It's so much struggle that he's watchful of this murderous group of what they're doing. The word remorse carries the idea of a change of a mind, a a strong regret from one's deeds. But the problem is there's no true repentance there. And Judas now has this seared conscience as, think about this, he attempts to do another deed to undo his sin. Judas returns these 30 pieces of silver, about the price of a slave in Jesus' day. Now, what will he do? Look at verse 4. He says this, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, what is that to us? See it to yourself. If Judas could have just rested on one sin that Jesus committed... And if he could find just one fault in Jesus, oh, he could feel justified in what he did. The fact is, even Judas in his depraved state, he knew Jesus was impeccable. He knew he had done nothing wrong. I have talked to men in jail for very heinous crimes, and they often admit what they did but they still refuse to follow Jesus in faith. So here we do not see the salvation of Judas. We just see great remorse and acknowledgement of an innocent Jesus. Notice he uses the phrase innocent blood. It's a very uh, strong term, isn't it? Some way he's trying to relieve his guilt, so he makes a statement that declares the blood of Christ is free of sins is really what he's saying. Well, the blood of Christ was already perfect, right? And he was now this perfect sacrifice for the sins of the elect, wasn't he? He was ready to go to the cross, and the hour of this final lamb had come, and this innocent blood was now going to be shed for the forgiveness of all those who by faith would believe in Christ alone, through grace alone for salvation, through this innocent blood. But it comes from the mouth of one who betrays. Look at verse 5. He threw the pieces of silver into the temple sanctuary and departed, and he went away and hung himself. Instead of pursuing Jesus for forgiveness, who's now being led away by these religious leaders, he returns to the temple of all places. There he finds these Jewish leaders that remain there, and he throws the money into the sanctuary. I know, if you're like me, I, I wish there was a little more commentary. I wish it said this. Judas ran, and he caught up with Jesus, and he begged him for forgiveness. And Jesus forgave him and sent him on his way. I wish that's what happened. That's not what happened. Judas had no recourse for his faithless actions, and his depraved heart led him to death. The money is called price, a price for blood there in verse 6. It's really like a trail of money, blood money is what it's called. They received illegal money to kill somebody, so they couldn't put it in the treasury, and so they buy a field and bury people like John Doe's. But all this was to fulfill the prophecy that God said. And so here in this first scene, as interesting as it is, maybe a scene you not think of on Good Friday. Here's Judas trying to justify his guilt, but can't. But in his 
remorse, he proclaims the innocent blood of Jesus Christ. Let's sing a song, Hayward. second scene comes from Mark 15, 16 through 21, and I call it the innocent suffering servant. We now come to the mocking and scourging of this innocent suffering servant of Isaiah. Verse 16 of Mark chapter 15 says, the soldiers took him away into into the place that is the praetorium, and they together, um, and called together the whole Roman cohort. Well, most likely these were men who were brought to guard Pilate who was in town for the week-long festival of Passover. These were Romans, they're not Jews, that's for sure, these guards. The text says that the soldiers took him away. 
Mark adds this section as a post-event to the trial, but when we look at the harmony of the Gospels, it kind of falls right in the middle of Pilate's trial. The pastor's not clear whether this was public or not. I know some of the movies that get put out, it seems like it's public, but we don't know this, but we do know what happened there. Jesus is taken into this praetorium. It's really a headquarters for these military officers. Pilate would use them to stay there, and this is very Gentile and very military. Jesus is alone. There's no disciples, none of his people. He's there with the Romans. The Bible says they called the whole Roman cohort a a legion of 6,000 men, and they say a cohort is about ten a tenth of that and so depending on who was on duty and who was available there was up to 600 men here ready to abuse jesus most likely not all of them were there it's possible that some of these soldiers were involved with jesus arrest the night before but this has been a long long night on jesus this innocent suffering Savior has been arrested in the garden with his disciples the night before who fled from him. He's then taken and abused by Annas, then Caiaphas, then Herod, and now Pilate's soldiers. He doubtlessly has little sleep, little food, little water, massive exhaustion. Notice in chapter 17, I mean, verse 17, he says they dressed him in purple here. This is the first step that comes with this brutal assault. The purple robe is something that would speak of royalty, a symbol of purity and royalty, probably some discarded cape of a Roman soldier, but nonetheless, they use it to mock him and they put it on him. The next step was they twisted a crown of thorns, the end of 17 says, and they put it on his head. Crowns, again, were symbols of royalty. They were marking a very unique and special person. The Romans considered their kings to be gods. Innocent royalty, they would call them. But Jesus' head was encircled with a crown made of thorns. Clearly, the goal is to make Jesus look like a king, but in a ridiculous and painful way. Matthew adds that they put put a reed in his hand like a scepter, and they had him sit down like he was on a throne And there they begin to mock him, and the scene is gruesome. Blood pouring down his face, flesh open from whippings, soldiers mocking. Verse 18 tells us, and they began to acclaim him, Hail, King of the Jews! They're hitting a new low now. They're paying homage to a king mockingly. It's all a big joke as they brutally assault him. They use the phrase, Hail, King of the Jews. This is a mocking display of what a familiar greeting would be to Emperor Caesar, who was considered to be a god. Verse 19 says they kept beating his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling and bowing before him. It's important to note that all these verbs are... Tell us, we don't know how long this took place. You notice that they snatch the reed from his hands and begin to club him with it. They spit on Jesus' face. I have a hard time getting my mind around that. We have to imagine this Lord with so brutally beaten and saliva running down his face. He's the innocent suffering servant, isn't he? All this is done in false worship, scorning, mocking. They're continuing to bow before him as our Lord is blooded and beaten. The mocking of the soldiers was not motivated from personal hatred. Maybe a few of them were there in the garden, possibly. Most of them have never seen Jesus before. These men are just showing their hatred towards the Jews and toward anyone who says they have a king but Caesar. The Romans had no tolerance for other kings, and they were showing it on Jesus. 
Jewish religious leaders are there, aren't they? And they may not be in this praetorium here, but they know what's going on, and they hand it, the only one who can save them, over to these people who would mock him in such a way. John later writes that he came to his own in his own what? Received him not, huh? Look at verse 20. After they mocked him, they took the purple robe off him and put on his own garments, and they led him out to be crucified. The Bible says after they mocked him. We don't know how long that lasted. Apparently it stopped. Pilate put a halt to him. We know this passage fits within the Luke passage where Pilate brings him back in the John passage. But throughout this, the silence of Jesus is remarkable. Clearly impressed the apostles, Peter said that Jesus, when he was reviled, did not revile and return, when threatened, did not threaten, but kept trusting himself to the one who judges righteously. In fact, even the, the difficulties of looking at our innocent suffering service is predicted in the Old Testament. Isaiah 50, verse 6 says this, I gave my back to those who strike me, and my cheek to those who pluck out the beard, and I did not cover my face from humiliation and spit. What a scene. What a scene of our suffering servant, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's sing another song. Here we go. Man of sorrows, Lamb of God, by His own betrayed the sin.
next scene comes from John chapter 19, 4 through 16. And here we see what I've entitled the innocent king. In verse 4, Pilate came out again and said to them, this is the scene kind of dropped into Mark here, or Mark dropped into this scene. Behold, I am bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. For some reason, Pilate must have thought that by bringing Jesus out completely humiliated by these soldiers and beat to a pulp, that maybe they would change their mind and agree with him that there was no fault in him. Verse 5 says that Jesus came out wearing a crown of thorns and purple robe. You can see this is before Mark's passage. And Pilate said to them, this is very important, Behold the man. What a phrase. Behold the man. As the apostles and writers of the scriptures recorded the truth of God's word being inspired, they knew who he was. He was the God-man. John said that he was the word who became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, we saw his glory, we witnessed it. Glory of the only begotten of the Father, the shared glory of the Father, and is full of grace and truth. Paul said there is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man. (laughs) The man Christ Jesus. But I don't think this is what Pilate was thinking. Pilate is presenting Jesus as no threat. That's what he's doing. He's just a poor creature that I've abused. See, it seems Pilate is using the term in somewhat of a condescending manner, isn't he? In other words, here's your so-called king. However, it's a reminder that though Jesus was fully God, he was fully man, wasn't he? He felt everything. He felt every whip, every thorn, Every phrase said to him, he felt it. And he suffered it as a man. See, he has to represent us in every way. He has to take our place. And he does this in his humanity, though he is a king. He's the greatest king because he took our place. Verse 6 says, So when the chief priests and the officers saw him, They cried out saying, crucify, crucify. See, Pilate might have thought he won the crowd over by abusing Jesus in this way, but he was wrong. It doesn't even faze them. The Jewish leaders had manipulated the crowd as well, and they cried out, crucify him. But Jesus told them many times, Jesus told his disciples at least nine different times, I think it's recorded in the scriptures, that I am going to be handed over to the chief priests, to the religious leaders, and they will have me crucified. And that's exactly what's going on here. And these gang of religious thuds, they waste no time to oppose Pilate's declaration of innocence here. They let him know what they want done to Jesus. And no matter how innocent Pilate thought Jesus was, there was no way that they were going to allow this man to become 
free. The statement from the Jews here, it says, crucify, crucify, really lays the guilt of murder on them, doesn't it? They reject it, the only way to God, and that's Jesus. This is not forgotten in the Scriptures. When we study the apostles as they teach the gospel to the early church throughout the Acts, throughout the book of Acts, at least six times in some of the greatest passages of the proclamation of who Jesus is, it records that the chief priests and the leaders turned him over to Pilate. End of verse 6 says this, Pilate said to them, take him yourself and crucify him. I find no fault in him. Again, a declaration of innocence. Pilate's reply seems somewhat irritable here. (laughs) He seems frustrated. In essence, Pilate is saying, you take him. You do it yourself. He knows they're manipulating him. He knows they're railroading him. But the Jews could not crucify Jesus. Their method of execution was stoning to death. But they didn't want that. They wanted something worse. You've got to understand this. Their hatred for Jesus was so great, they wanted him publicly cursed. Oh, there's a prophecy. And so crucifixion was the only thing they would accept. Verse 7 says, you said answered him and says, we have a law, and by that law he ought to die because he has made himself out to be the Son of God. They're quoting Leviticus 24, 16 that we looked at recently in our Wednesday night service, but they know that Jesus made himself out to be the Son of God, and if he's the Son of God, he's equal to God, and they knew what he was saying. They just didn't like it. Notice verse 8 and 9, therefore when Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid what statement is he talking about? That he made himself out to be the Son of God. That put great fear into Pilate. He's a polytheistic ruler, right? His wife has said, stay away from this man. Don't have anything to do with him. And it seems Pilate is now being gripped with fear. And Pilate definitely believes in the deification of leaders. And now there's one in his presence who is claimed to be the son of God. I imagine Pilate had heard about the miracles of Jesus. His next question really verifies this. Notice in verse 9, as he entered into the Praetorium again, he said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Where are you from? Are you a God? What am I dealing with here? Jesus doesn't speak to him, and clearly Pilate does not like this lack of response to his authority, and he sees this as a disregard to his power. Jesus' lack of response causes Pilate to realize that he shares too in this coming crucifixion. Verse 11, verse 10, he says, Don't you know that I have the authority to release you and I have authority to crucify you? (laughs) Jesus replied, verse 11 says, Oh, you have no authority over me. Finally, he speaks. And it's powerful. Unless it had been given to you above, for this reason, he who delivers me over to you has the greater sin. See, Jesus corrects Pilate's mistaken authority here. Explains to him that he has no authority unless it's granted above. He who delivers me to you has a greater sin. I first thought you may think that's Judas, but I don't think that's who it is. Judas did not deliver Jesus to Pilate. He's talking about the religious leaders. He's talking about Caiaphas and Annas and the religious leaders. Verse 12, he says, as a result of this, after hearing all of this, particularly that that he did not have authority over Jesus, Pilate made efforts to release him. See, something happened there. He realized, "Uh uh-oh, I'm in over my head here. 
I thought I was a king. I thought I was a ruler. I think I'm dealing with something greater than me. And he begins to tremble in a sense. This only strengthens the case that Jesus was the Son of God, the true, innocent King of kings. Because only Jesus can pass judgment. Only the King of kings can pass judgment. And Pilate backs off. The rest of verse 12 says, if the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself out to be a king opposes Caesar. And so Pilate's half-hearted attempt to release Jesus is so trumpeted, trumped by this manipulated crowd now. Remember, they asked Jesus in chapter 18, Pilate in his first go around with him said, are you a king? He says, it is as you say. But the Jews now have cornered Pilate. See, if he releases Jesus, they could bring damaging accusations against Pilate to Rome. And though Pilate seemed to have some kind of distorted feelings to release Jesus, his love for self-preservation was much greater. Verse 13, Pilate gets the message. Therefore, when Pilate heard these things, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at the place called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Pilate is now fully manipulated. At the mention of Caesar's name, Jesus' fate is sealed. He's not going to go against this. And then in verse 14, we see him, that it was the day of preparation for the Passover. And here Pilate stands up, it's about the sixth hour, and he stands up and he says, Behold your king. After he's proclaimed his innocence numbers of times. And remember, in the background are probably the bleeding of sheep who are being sacrificed. And here the king of kings is on trial. He is an innocent king who died for his subjects. Let's sing again.
now skip ahead to a fourth scene that I have entitled The Innocent Savior. This is found in Luke 23, 32 through 43. Here we find a scene with three crosses but just one Savior. Luke 23, 32 reads this way, Two others also who were criminals were being led away to be put to death with him. There were three crosses on that hill on Golgotha that day, and yet salvation would only come from just one of those. Why three crosses? Why does God have two criminals, two men crucified with the Lord of glory? Wouldn't this rob or take away from the glory of the Lord as he is stretched out almost arm to arm with these criminals? Perhaps these probably most likely three naked bodies are somewhat so disfigured and undistinguishable you would not know one from another. But without a doubt, God arranged this scene. And He arranged it before the foundations of the world. And now, I think for all of us who are believers in this room, these three crosses are iconically fixed in our minds and our hearts, aren't they? I think it's worth thinking about why God did this, why he predestined that Jesus would hang in his finest hour and most sorrowful hour between these two men. Certainly God could have destined and designed Jesus to die alone, but God had a different plan, and that was to show the depravity of man hanging right next to him and the power of salvation through Christ alone. And through God's perfect plan, we now have the privilege of listening in on a conversation when we read this, one that maybe few people ever heard. These were men condemned who had no hope. The scene, this scene really lets us see the end of life of two different men as they agonize in their last hours. Matthew and Mark record that both these men were verbally reviling the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that it was about six hours to kill Christ. He was crucified on the third hour, which was 9 a.m., with these two criminals. We know that Jesus was offered in this time this wine that was mixed with myrrh. It was a kind of an elixir that would mask some of the pain that he was suffering, but Jesus refused it. We do not know if the other criminals accepted it, but we know Jesus refused it. He wanted to feel the full weight of the wrath of God for us. Next we see the soldiers gambling over his garments as they cast lots for the spoil of the soon-to-be-dead And then comes the passerbyers. These mocking Jesus as he willingly hangs between these two sinners. The Bible tells us that the chief priests and the scribes were among the scoffers who chided him. They said he could rebuild the temple in three days and yet he cannot save himself. But one of the thieves is watching And he's listening to all this as he suffers for the wages of his sins. The Bible says it's now the sixth hour, so it's noon. And all of a sudden, darkness blankets the land for three hours. It seems in the text that one of the criminals continues to revile Christ, but the other's grown silent. Is he taking note of the unnatural darkness that veils the land? Has that caught his attention? Has he noticed that the man in the middle does not revile when he's reviled? What's going through his mind as he sees Jesus cry out to his father in pleading for the forgiveness of those who tortured him? What's he thinking? We pick up the verses in verse 39. The Bible says one of the criminals who was hanging there was hurtling abuse at him, 
saying, are you the, not the Christ? Save yourself and us. And now the silent man speaks. But the other answered and rebuking him said, do you not even fear God? Since you are under the same sentence of condemnation. And we indeed are suffering justly for what we are receiving, what we deserve for our deeds. But this man, the innocent Savior, has done nothing wrong. And he said to him, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. See, there's a clear and remarkable change in one of the thieves' hearts, isn't there? He, he graciously, but with amazing accuracy of theology, rebukes his former mocking partner. Don't you fear God? Something's happened. There's now this clear connection between God and Christ in this man's speech. He clearly understands that the wages of sin is death, and he and his former partner are getting what they do deserve. And then in the middle of this chaotic scene, this former blasphemer proclaims the impeccability of his desired Savior. He has done nothing. We do not want to linger here, but the Savior of the world hangs between these two men. He's doubtlessly unrecognizable. The whips have torn his flesh from his body. His face is marred beyond all recognition. But it doesn't stop him from saving. See, it is this one, this innocent Savior to whom the thief turns to. And he makes one of the greatest statements in all of human history. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That's all he says. There's no further comment recorded in the Scriptures. There's no confession of more sins. There's no promise that he'll live for God the rest of his life. There's no baptism. There's no long years of progressive sanctification. No further testing to prove his genuineness of his faith, not even a visible single good deed. But then comes our Lord's response. Truly I say to you today, whew, you will be with me in paradise. Our Lord dies and meets him there. And Jesus, this innocent Savior, secures this man's eternity, not based on anything he had done, but Jesus knew his father had plunged faith into this young man's heart, and that's all he needed. Faith alone, through grace alone, through Christ alone. See, God ordained this eternal encounter of three men on crosses on a hill outside of Jerusalem shaped like a skull. And it's recorded for our sake to remind us of Christ's innocence and that he can save wrecked lives and self-righteous lives and goody-two-shoe lives. I'm trying to get us all in here. He can save. He's an innocent Savior. And just like he plunged faith in that heart of that violent aggressor, he can cause anyone to become a worshiper. And he can do it at the 11th hour. The thief found an innocent Savior. Let's sing another song. Lord, you're weeping with me. Help me to believe that when my heart is heavy as a stone, 
Scene. We stay here in Luke 23, 44 through 49, and I call it the innocent man. Through the years of growing in the Lord and studying his word, I've come to love a hypostatic union of Christ. And that simply means this beautiful, full relationship as God and full relationship as man. 
And we spend a lot of time trying to protect the deity of Jesus Christ against the false religions. But his humanity is every bit important. Because if he's not man, he can't die. And if he doesn't die, we all go to hell. And this is the scene of his death. Verses 44 and the beginning of 45 read this way. It was now about the sixth hour and darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour because the sun was obscured. Three hours of unnatural darkness. <laughs> Some would explain by a word here called obscured. Eklepo uh, is the word in it means to leave out or to give out. The ESV says it failed. It's interesting, isn't it? What happened here? Well, the Passover is always hell in a full moon. So that eliminates some solar eclipse. And Satan has no power to, to do something in God's created world like this. He has no power to do that. We do know that God caused the similar form of judgment to follow upon Egypt. But they said the darkness was so dark that you could feel it. And so we must start to understand that this is God's judgment on His Son. The blackness fell upon Calvary that day because Jesus was bearing our sins. In a sense... We see the darkness of hell fall on that town, on Jerusalem. Hell is described as the black of blackness. And God has unleashed his full wrath of, for sin on his son on our behalf. The latter part of verse 45 says this, And the veil of the temple was torn in two. Well, the context seems to support that, that this blackness was lifted and as it was lifted there they began to see that this veil was torn and doubtlessly the spiritually blind priest started to resume the slaughter of Passover lambs only to be stopped by doubtlessly someone shouting hey the veil's been ripped <laughs> and it just wasn't torn it was ripped from top to bottom Matthew says See, this was the end of the need of the temple. Christ made a way now through his finished work. He brings his elect right into the presence of God. So the innocent man, the man Christ Jesus, the man who is the mediator for all who believe, now leads us through the veil into his precious presence of his Father. Other texts tell us at this time the earth began to shake. Massive earthquake, tombs opened, bodies of saints who were dead were risen and came out of those tombs. But now with all the things completed and direct access is given to the Father, Jesus begins to speak his last words. Verse 46, Jesus cries out with a loud voice and says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Right before this, John 19, 28 says that he said, Jesus said, I thirst. He had denied himself any drink throughout his judgment on the cross to experience the full weight of God's wrath. But everything's accomplished now. The veil's torn. There's direct access to Christ now and Jesus takes a drink and he demonstrates that he's in total control and he in total control gives up his life. It's amazing. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And with that said, our Lord is physically dead. Verse 47 says, Now when the centurion saw what had happened, he began to praise God, saying, certainly this man was innocent. What he bore witness to that day 
had to bring an utter amazement to his soul. He knew this was no normal man that could do this in his right mind and right body. No one would have control of his faculties who went through what Jesus went through. Normally, concussions and lack of oxygen would make the victim incoherent long before he was dead. (laughs) But not Jesus. Not the final lamb. Not the innocent God man. Jesus had control of death. Death did not have control of him. Amen? And the centurion's response to this is priceless. The Bible says he began praising God, saying, certainly, without a doubt, this man was innocent. There it is again. The proclamation of the impeccability of Christ. This was yet another divine proclamation. And it seems that this centurion soldier becomes the first convert after Christ's death. At least as far as we know. Verse 48 And all the crowds who had came together for this spectacle, it's what it was, it was just a big show in some ways. When they observed what had happened, began to return, beating their breast. This is a sign of guilt and terror. Think about this, maybe there were some there that experienced the joy of the triumphal entry. A few days later, they were crying, crucify him. Now they're going away, terrified at the judgment of God. I think, my thoughts, I think some of these are those who got saved at Pentecost. Verse 49, our last verse says this, and all his acquaintances and the women who accompanied him from Galilee were standing at a distance seeing these things. Now the last scene, scene really brings into view Christ's true followers Though doubtlessly confused and unable to comprehend all that had taken place, these would receive the Spirit of God and they'd be part for sure of that great multitude of the birth of the church. And they would carry the message of the gospel unashamed. Disciples would become apostles. Apostles who were afraid and ran away would stand before their killers because Christ was crucified for them. And they were unashamed of this gospel. But that's not the end of the story, is it? Christ's lifeless body is laid in a tomb, the Bible says, but his spirit is very much alive. First Peter tells us that he goes and proclaims victory over sin, Satan, and death to the spirits that are bound in Hades. And then on resurrection morning, his body begins to breathe And in an ultimate stamp of approval by his Father, he is resurrected to show victory over our sin. But it's Friday. And Sunday's coming. Let's sing a song here. So for this last song, I'm going to invite you all to stand as we sing this uh, song together.
leaders are very encouraged to see how many of you came out tonight. Some of you fought through traffic to be here. Um, praise the Lord for you all. I pray your heart was stirred today. The gospel never gets old, does it? God's amazing grace never ceases to be amazing to the true believer. And I pray you are, you are motivated to love your Savior more. Well, we have two more services left this weekend. Sunrise service will be outside at 630. I promise you, you're going to really enjoy that service. And then a very completely different service will be our 1045 service. And we are looking forward to a great morning of music and praising God. And we're going to study how Jesus comes out of that grave and what that means for us for today and for all of eternity. So come back. Bring a friend. It's not too late. Invite somebody. God may save them this week. So go find someone to bring. Have a great evening. We'll see you Sunday. <laughs>